Hello vlog channel, I am ending my Patreon, which means I'm essentially going to be making the bonus videos that I have been posting on Patreon and making them for my vlog channel so that everybody can see them. And also I thought I've made a lot of content in the last year and a half-ish, so I'm going to share some now. So big shout out to anyone who has ever been a patron of mine, even for like one month. I appreciate you so much and I had a lot of fun making these videos and I'm really excited to share them with the public audience. I decided to just like put them together and release them in batches because vlogmas-esque spirit. Um, and yeah, I hope that you enjoy these. I'm I'm specifically sharing the behind the vid videos that I've done. So these are like analytics, talking through my process of making videos, responding to comments, kind of expanding on different issues that come up after I post a video. I think it's interesting. Thanks! Hello my dudes, welcome to the Patreon! Ooh! I don't know exactly what this is always going to be, but I've been thinking about this idea of talking about my videos after they're released so that the dialogue can continue a little bit more um, because I find that after I post a video and I read the comments, there are some other things that I would like to discuss and usually that is limited to just replying to comments. I also have some behind the scenes sort of stuff that I guess might be interesting to talk about so I'm going to uh, start with that. So for this video, let's talk about my last video about the meme analysis of normies and locals. First, I'm checking out my time clock. I use this app called Clockify to track my work now. Um, I've been doing this for mm, the last like four or five months because someone asked me how long it takes me to make a video and I had no idea what to tell them. So this has really helped me um, have a clearer vision of how long it takes me to do certain tasks, how long each video in total takes, how much time I'm spending on my podcast or my second channel or administrative stuff that's just like emails I'm like, what else falls under housekeeping, as I call it? Normies and Locals took a total of 28 and a half hours of tracked time. Of course, that's not always entirely accurate because there's other time that I might spend loosely thinking about a video or whatever, but I do try to be pretty accurate and track all the times where I'm like really actively working on a video. Of that 28 and a half hours, we have 11 hours of editing, nine hours of writing, two hours and 40 minutes of final touches, which always takes longer than I expect. That includes thumbnails, titles, descriptions, timestamps, going over the captions, all those tiny little things uh, before a video goes live to make sure that everything is good, adding links to my sources or references. And then filming for that video took two and a half hours and I think that includes the time that I spend on the sponsor in the video, but you would be surprised. Filming and editing the sponsor mention can take me so long because you have to get specific B-roll and certain shots that the sponsor requests. And then of course they have specific talking points or things that they want you to mention. So I take a lot of time to make sure that I hit all those points and I try to say them in the most natural way <laughs> for myself. That usually is me in front of the camera repeating each line multiple times to see which one sounds the most natural, which one is the most quick and flowing. And then when it comes to editing it down into its perfect little mention spot, that takes a long time as well. Deciding what to keep, what to cut, again, making sure I hit those talking points and keeping it within the time that it is supposed to be. Other than that, usually filming an actual internet analysis video takes mm, sometimes like an hour and a half. So that adds up. So 28 and a half hours, normies and locals. <laughs> Every time I think a video is like a quicker, easier one, it's not. <laughs> it takes just as long as the other ones. Again, this video was just on my list. It was just something I wanted to do. And I also wanted to experiment with the meme analysis format, I guess, because those are slightly different than my typical internet analysis videos, just because it's a little bit more, like part of it is like linguistics research. Like part of it is just social trends, um, things that I'm not an expert in, obviously, but I think it can be really fun also, and those videos can sometimes be a little more lighthearted, which was kind of what I was aiming for for this one. The tough spot that I fell into was the whole 
alt-right uh, side of the normies lore, and I was really conflicted about how much of that to include in the script because I didn't want the video to um, gloss over that too much and disregard that whole side of it. Um, but I also, as I mentioned, didn't want it to be too heavy, and I didn't want um, I didn't want the sponsor to come back to me potentially and be like, "Hey, you're talking about you know neo Nazis and the alt right like a lot in this video, and that's not really what we want." Luckily, they didn't have a problem with it. Uh, but yeah, I just chose to kind of just briefly mention it and not have that be a big part of the video, which I think was a good decision. So I am so congested. <laughs> I never realized how congested I am until I can hear how congested I sound once I start filming. And that's just another fun thing to be aware of. So this video in the creator studio as of right now is ranked six out of 10. So the Creator Studio tells us out of our last 10 videos how it's doing, how it's performing in terms of views, view duration, and total watch time. So 6 out of 10 is not terrible. Obviously, that's like average. Um, it's interesting to see like within the first hour or two of a video going live, you can see what the ranking is. And it's, it's so disappointing. <laughs> to finish one of these videos, upload it, and then see a low ranking. Like if it's like a nine or a 10 within the first two hours, I'm just like, all right, I'm a flop. Great. This one went from like a three to a four to a five to a six. I think it got a jump from my initial like viewers who watch pretty quickly. And then I think it's just not a topic that's like searchable. It's not a topic that's necessarily topical right now. So I can understand why this one is not blowing up as much as like my last two videos did, <laughs> but that's okay. It's the name of the game. It's at 138,000 views right now. I'm just glad once a video crosses 100, then I'm like, all right, that's that's okay. Ideally, I would like it to cross 200, but um, this one might just be a lower viewed video and that's just how it is. Oh yeah, so this one, I really struggled. I don't do like my thumbnails until I'm right about to post a video. So um, that's usually not a good idea because thumbnails can be so important to how a video does. Obviously it, it attracts the viewers. So I went to start making this one and usually I try to make these internet analysis thumbnails very visual, obviously, if I can include relevant creators or people. Like I think that's why my last two videos did well partially was because Kylie Jenner was in one and that's recognizable. And then the last one had Sophia Nygaard and Best Dressed, two very popular recognizable YouTubers. So I think that helped. I try to do minimal text, but I do do a little bit of text in each thumbnail. Um, and for this one, I was like, how do I visually represent normies and locals? I was like, do I try to visually represent normies and locals or do I represent the judgment of calling people normies and locals? And so, my first thumbnail, I was like, meh, okay, let's just post the video. And then it was kind of mm, not performing too well. And I thought maybe it's the thumbnail's fault partially. <laughs> Again, I know that the topic, you know, subject matter is also part of that. So then like an hour or two after it was posted, I went back and made a different thumbnail, which is more word heavy. Like it has the Urban Dictionary um, names and some little definitions and then a little graphic that just has this like extremely online thing. So I thought that this maybe represented the topic a little bit better, and so I changed it. So let's talk about the topic. What what happened? Did I have any interesting uh, feedback for this specifically? I did have one person reply after I had posted on Instagram that I made a new thumbnail. I was like, oh, maybe this thumbnail works better. I had someone comment that I saw that said, no matter how many times you change the thumbnail, it's not gonna make the topic interesting. And I was like, wow roast me. By the way, Alexa, stop listening to me. Nathan got us this Alexa, and I don't like having it in the house. And she just lit up listening to me, and I'm like, hello, you're not involved in this. Stop it. I'm very opposed to this technology. I don't need it. I can turn my music on myself, thank you. So I'm gonna look at the top comments, see if anything pops out. As an ex-edgelord, I have come to the bitter realization that mainstream things and popular things are popular for a reason. They're good. Yes, I tend to be like that a lot of times. I've talked about how I tend to resist things that are popular. I try to not be this like uh, contrarian hipster. I'm really not trying to say like my taste is better than anyone. I just have some sort of aversion to things that are super popular. And then I will wait and then years later I will 
crawl over and check them out and go, oh, it is pretty good, usually. Sometimes it's like, eh, okay. A lot of people wanted to appreciate my shirt in this video, which is from Lisa Says Ga, but it's rented from Newly, of course. And I like it. It was, it was an interesting choice. I don't usually wear anything like patterned or anything, and that style of shirt is very different for me, so it was fun. Memes like this are the reason people are so ashamed of their interests. I'd rather someone be a local and be true to what they like than be whatever the opposite of a local is and be pretending to be someone they're not. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a big part of the, the conversations going on in the comments was like, obviously people should not be ashamed of their interests unless your interests are harmful, like genuinely harmful. Like it doesn't matter if you like things that are basic, basic quote unquote. It doesn't matter if you like things that are popular or mainstream or super niche and misunderstood or whatever. Like, I don't know why I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure. Someone commented, oh, how peaceful it must be to not be constantly online. And I was like, oh my God, honestly, truly, how, how, how much peace would I experience if I did not know anything about all this internet culture? Well, it's like maybe I'd just be more tuned into like real world events. I think either way, we all need our escapism and you can debate like, is it healthy or not to fall into escapism? Um, obviously you don't wanna like escape your whole life and all your responsibilities, but I think especially in these times, like I'm not going to fault anyone for wanting to you know, not think about real life for a certain period of time. I totally get that. Another comment, honestly, at this point, I don't mind being basic. It feels so childish to constantly be trying to keep up with internet trends. I feel that. I mean, that makes me feel better about my age. Um, again, not that I think I'm old, but I am older than the young, young people driving the internet culture for the most part. I mean, there's also people driving internet culture that are my age and much older. So I think, yeah, it, it does boil down to trying to keep up with trends. Like some people just kind of effortlessly keep up with or are tuned into certain trends. And then there's the side where you have to actively put effort in and it's not something that you're enjoying or doing because you want to, it's because you feel like you're obligated to. Um, so yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm already so tired, <laughs> you know? Like I don't have the energy to be like, well, I've got to make sure I'm wearing the trendy clothes and doing the trendy things. Mm -mm, no such time. I did get this comment that I somewhat felt bad about, but then I was like, okay, whatever, it's fine. I don't need to over explain. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned that like calling someone a local and making fun of them for staying in their hometown or living at their parents' house should not be an insult because people go through shit and you don't know why, you know, they're in their circumstances. So Ruth commented, hilarious slash cringe that the only reason that someone would end up in their hometown is hardship. Maybe they just like it and actively chose it because they think it's the best option. As you age and particularly in a pandemic, wanting to have your family as part of your every, everyday life, not just holidays, is valid. And I, this is part of my response when I start seeing the comments flow in. I don't think she was trying to like be critical of me. She's just like leaving a comment about that point. But I take things so personally and I'm like, oh my God, no, now she thinks that I think that that's true, that the only reason you'd stay in your hometown is hardship. And I, I get into this habit of being so defensive right away or not really defensive, but more so trying to over explain myself. So I sit and like, I start writing these replies to comments that are way too long. And I have to catch myself and be like, it's not that deep, it's fine. Like I like replying to these comments and sometimes I can quickly clarify something, but it's like, if I can say it in like a sentence or two versus if I have to write a few paragraphs, then I'm over explaining and I'm doing too much. Let's see what my response was. I just said, true, exclamation points to know that I'm saying this in a, a nice way. <laughs> Jesus, the way that we communicate tone online. True, if any of my family were still near my hometown, I'd love to live there again. And a couple other people made this point, like, I love my hometown, or like, this is not an issue in my hometown, people like to stay here. And um, I saw other comments where people said, like, this seems like a very distinctly American thing, and like, the shame of like, being an American and not moving out the second you're 18, where in a lot of other uh, countries, that's not the norm at all, and a lot of people stay in their family home for many years, uh, even sometimes after they're married, they'll live with family in intergenerational homes. So yes, it is a very American uh, concept. That's something that I consider when I'm making my videos is like, oh, should I be thinking about things and making sure I'm not being too, too 
United States-y here? Should I make sure I mention that? But I feel like it, to a point, it just gets too much. Like, I can't make that point about everything. There are definitely certain situations where it's important to point out, like, oh, this is a uniquely American thing, which a lot of things are uniquely American. We, we tend to do things a little differently than a lot of the world because we're so different. We're so independent, quote unquote. We're so individualistic, definitely. There is, though, to this, to this idea, like, there's this stereotype of, like, oh, you come from a small town and, like, the only people who would stay there don't want to, you know, do anything beyond that. They don't want to move to the big cities and therefore they are inferior because they don't have those big dreams, blah, blah, blah. It's like a trope in media, but it's also kind of true in the way that some people think of other people. And um, especially, I think, if you come from perhaps a particularly conservative town and you're not conservative, then that's something that you want to outgrow in a sense, or at least abandon or move away from, distance yourself from physically. People have a lot of reasons, again, for wanting to either leave or maybe they don't necessarily hate their hometown, but maybe they just don't love it, they don't see a future there, etc. But of course, yeah, there's the other side of the coin where you might live in a place that you love and you might want to stay there. And yeah, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. I would love that, actually. I'm really jealous of, like, Nathan's family, for example, because they've all, like, lived in the same towns for, like, generations. He has, like, multiple generations of his family and most of his family is within this, like, very small radius. And I just cannot relate to that because even back home in California, I had family within, like, a few hours and then I had family in other states. So, like, I've never had, like, a hometown where everyone is, like, grandma's house is down the street. I would have loved that and it would be a lot more convenient you know, for any times that we have family events or holidays to have everyone in one place, but that's just not how my family is laid out. Anyway, good comment. <laughs> There's this other comment that's talking about how, um, obviously the misogynistic undertones of the word basic, because it's usually been used like basic bitch, referring to basic white girls, usually these very like girly or considered to be mainstream interests or styles. One thing is I feel like I don't mention misogyny very often in my videos, which is something I'm trying to unpack myself because like in my last video about um, popular YouTubers, people said, oh yeah, and like a lot of these creators you're talking about are women. And a lot of the creators that get criticized the most for not posting enough or all of these other issues are women. And maybe like, is the criticism for women on YouTube or on the internet a lot more intense than male creators? Potentially. I mean, probably, actually. <laughs> um, but again, yeah, I don't know why it's not necessarily my first instinct to include that as like a major mention in the video. I feel like part of it to me is just that it's so obvious. <laughs> like, it almost doesn't even feel like it's worth a point to say like, oh, and misogyny, because I feel like that that's relevant in almost every issue when you're talking about like culture, you know? But it's a good reminder because it's made me think like maybe I should be more intentional about including those points and a little more intersectional feminism specifically in my videos, even though, you know, I think my, my points in my discussions do come from an intersectional feminist lens, but I feel like I don't vocalize that enough, maybe. Let me know, I don't know. <laughs> I thought I wasn't old when I knew what normies and locals were, but then I felt old again when Tiffany was relating the relatable tweets with disdain. It's funny because when I was finding those, like, yes, there was disdain. And I was like, mm, like, I wouldn't retweet this. I wouldn't post this on my story. But would I potentially laugh at it? Probably. So, like, that's a funny line to examine. Like, the things that we laugh at or enjoy or whatever, but aren't willing to show publicly as part of our brand, even as individual internet users, because we're all considered to be curators of our own pages. Um, I find that really interesting. I've been thinking a lot about like the whole idea of like, retweets are not endorsements, blah, blah, blah. But I find myself being very aware of like everything that I like even, like even just like which tweets I like or which Instagram posts I like. And I find myself thinking like, I don't know, it's such a strange thing to, to think that people see your likes as endorsements, which of course they are to some extent, but um, it can just be taken out of context or people can say like, 
Like, I don't know. It's kind of like, oh, if you liked someone's, one of someone's tweets or Instagram posts, then that means you agree with everything that they've ever done or said ever. And it's like, no. <laughs> anyway, that's a completely different situation. But um, I think it does tie into the responsibility or the weight that we put on every aspect of our internet usage now, especially in these public pages or, you know, pages where you have your face or your identity attached to them. Okay, th I think that's about it. This video honestly didn't have too much. I don't remember there being um, super, super deep discussions in the video, which again is good because I like to mix my deeper videos with a little more light, light content, which hopefully doesn't have like intense reactions. But I've also stepped back from the comments as I do. Um, I tend to read, you know, the, the comments as they come in the first day, and then I check the top comments, and then I have to pull back because, you know. Again, I start being um, in this mode where I want to explain everything if someone has a question or misunderstands some point or I left something out that they think I should have left in. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I don't know what to call this yet. I think Philosophy Tube calls these postmortems after her videos go up, but I don't want to steal that. <laughs> I'm like behind the scenes and also a, a post video examination discussion, but that's not catchy, is it? No, it's not. So we'll figure it out, but I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And if you have any other suggestions for what sort of content I should be posting on this Patreon, let me know. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you so much. Thank you. Kisses. Wow, you get kisses now. All right. Woo. Hello, my dudes. Welcome to the Patreon. And here we are with some Patreon exclusives and a bra strap that's falling down. This is the type of exclusive content you're going to receive. Um, so I've wanted to do these kind of recaps to the responses of my videos, response to a response videos, just to keep the discussions going after my videos. And I also want to show you a little bit of behind the scenes and some analytics. Um, after the videos are posted in case that's your sort of thing. Oh, Nathan's calling me. Hello. Anyway, where was I? Let's get into it. First, I want to tell you guys how long it took me to make this video. I've been tracking my work process and it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, so we're talking about the why YouTubers, why popular YouTubers stop posting. This video only took me 23 hours which is a little bit shorter than my average, and that's interesting to some extent. Is it? I don't know. This video was interesting because um, it was not sponsored, which is rare for me these days, because usually the sponsored deadlines are what kind of, you know, kick my ass and make me actually post a video. So it was not sponsored, but um, it had been a while since I had posted and I knew that I needed to post something. and. Um, this video had been on my list for a while, but I didn't think that it was gonna be that popular. And I thought, you know, it'll just be a video that I'd post. If it flops, then that's fine. Um, I just need to post something, get something out there, stop my creative rut. I just need to like work through that. And just, cause I find that, you know, as I mentioned in the video, my stress and pressure goes up the longer it's been since my last upload. So sometimes I just have to accept like, this video might not be perfect, but just do it. So I felt like in the scripting process, I felt like, do I even have enough to say in this? Like, I don't want this to sound like a, oh, YouTubers have such hard lives, like, type of thing. And so I ended up just filming it before the script was like really finished. I usually like my script to be like literally exactly what I wanna say. And I sit and I time myself and I um, see how long it'll be and how it's flowing and stuff. But this one, I was like, I'm just gonna go with it see how it works, and if I have to fix it in editing, then I will. So that's kind of what I did. And it did end up working out well. In editing, I did have to rearrange some things. I, I've been doing this thing now where when I'm editing, when I get near like the end stages, if I'm trying to see if a video or if a section is going on too long, I write out like rough timestamps for the rough cut of the video. And then I see like, oh, this section's going on for like five minutes. <laughs> like, can I cut that down a little bit? And I found that that helps me like see if my video is like imbalanced in that way, if that makes sense. So I did that and we'll get into it later, but let's talk more about the work of this video. So out of the 23 hours for this video, almost 12 hours was editing, which makes sense. I had to 
make sense of the footage that I had because it wasn't as straightforward as usual. Um, but usually editing is my biggest chunk anyway. Writing for this video only took three and a half hours. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot less than my typical stuff. L based on my other videos, it takes me at least eight to 12 hours to write a typical video, internet analysis video. So three and a half hours is very quick, which is crazy. Every time I'm like, how did it take me 11 hours to write that video? But it is, that does con include all of my time where I'm just like thinking and like figuring out how to phrase things or like how to organize things. So that includes all of that process. Final touches for that video took two hours and 20 minutes. That includes thumbnail, that includes description, putting in links, um, doing my timestamps, doing a check of the captions, adjusting the mid-roll ad breaks, all of that fun detailed stuff. So that's basically it. So this video was actually one of my shorter processes compared to a lot of my internet analysis typical workflow. So that's interesting. How did it perform, baby? Um, it's my highest viewed video in a long time. It was ranked number one. Um, YouTube Studio has this ranking thing, your last 10 videos, it compares them based on views, um, retention, and total watch time. So this one was ranked number one pretty much like as soon as it was posted and then it continued to stay number one. That was really exciting and really unexpected because again, I thought this video was gonna flop. <laughs> like I thought this video was not gonna be, um, sorry, that's very loud. It's like they don't even know I'm filming a Patreon exclusive. So yeah, I thought this video was gonna flop, which is the funniest thing because it's done so much better than a lot of my videos in a long time. It is at 672,000 views right now, which is fantastic. Let's look and see, when was the last time I had a video over that? Wow, it's been a long time, holy. Even my Karen meme, which is my second highest in like the last year, I think, has 660. So wow, that's really fucking good. Wow, Jesus Christ. The only other video that had more views than that is the Dark Sides of Flex Culture, which is at 1.4 million views now. So that's really interesting. The funny thing about a video doing well is like you take it for granted, which is so weird because I'm always chasing a good performing video. I'm chasing a number one video, blah, blah, blah. But like once you have that little bit of success for a minute, it's so easy to just be like, ah, cool. Like I've said this multiple times, but I can tell when my channel is doing really well, when my little brother and my mom text me about how my video is doing, they'll be like, oh my God, it has 100,000 views in 12 hours. Or like it got 200,000 views like in one day. Um, when my channel was like blowing up in like late 2019, really growing really fast, um, I got so used to that that I was like, yeah, yeah, like that's cool. And now I'm like, oh my God, I would love if every video was performing that well. Um, but of course, you know, your growth is not gonna stay the same um, forever. And you can't have those, you can't have number one ranked videos all the time, by the way, Amanda made a video that was really great about this exact issue, like the the stress that we all feel as creators to constantly be outperforming ourselves. It's just not possible and not sustainable. So yeah, before this video was the Obnoxious Closets of the Super Rich, which at that point was one of my best performing videos in a long time with 520,000 views. So I was just like, I think I was off the high of that last video where I was like, oh, that video did really well. Now this video is doing really well, hmm, cool. And I was so casual about it. And now I'm like, my last video um, about the normies and locals has 138,000. So like, you never know. There's no guarantee that like, you're gonna keep hitting like half a million views in a day or two, whatever. Um, <laughs> by the way, I'm filming both of these first two Patreon videos at the same time. This idea has been in my list for a while, but I just haven't sat down to do the things until today. Here I am pretending it's a different time by wearing a different shirt. Clever. This video did very well, and it did really well among other YouTubers, unsurprisingly. But that's something I didn't anticipate um, when I was making this video. I was kind of directing it more toward trying to give the audience a more sympathetic view 
a more understanding view of what YouTubers go through, but obviously that resonates with other YouTubers who can relate to what I was saying. So I kept getting comments from like so many of my favorite YouTubers or just seeing like the randomest YouTubers pop into this comment section and it was so exciting because like, you know, it's validating. It feels nice to be, you know, hyped up or to have other YouTubers tell you that you're doing a good job or whatever. Um, but yeah, c clearly this one strikes a chord and a lot of people feel this way. I mean, I don't know how you could possibly be a relatively big channel or even, even a small channel, a channel of any size. Like these things are kind of universal experiences. And that was something that I really liked in going through the comments was like, it's not just big YouTubers. Like again, small YouTubers, medium, YouTubers of any size go through this pressure and this burnout and the fatigue from criticism and feeling really stressed about it all, but also trying to be thankful for what you have. And also I, I liked that people tied it to other mediums because it's not just YouTube, you know, any sort of creative field, especially ones that expect constant content creation these days. It's like whether you run an art page or a photo page or you're a writer or a journalist, you're expected to be cranking out content. <laughs> that was so dorky. Cranking out content, um, churning that butter of content, whatever. You're expected to be creating mind-blowing, brilliant, incredible, um, relevant stuff constantly. And it's like, there's nobody can do that. I've thought about that. Like we wouldn't expect musicians to be able to put out a new album full of bangers every six months. That would be ridiculous. Or like to expect authors to publish a new novel every year or whatever, like whatever the time frame is. I've thought a lot about relating to other artists or creatives. I hate using that word because it feels so like elitist as if there's this like, we're the creatives and you guys are the not creatives. That's not how things work. Most people are creative in some way, but like in terms of your job primarily being powered by creativity in this way, when it comes to making some form of art, for example, whatever, or just content, whatever. Um, <laughs> when it requires new fresh ideas that are gonna be somehow marketed to other people, I think that's like a very vague umbrella. Lost my train of thought and nobody's here to help me because I'm recording this and nobody can remind me what I was saying. Yeah, so just like that, there is this expectation, even if it's just on the small level of like keeping your Instagram page alive, like, you know, we usually don't have that much going on or that much content or that many photo shoots or like whatever it is that you post or you do, the average person cannot sustain that. You might be able to do it for like a week, but like you might get burnt out, you might lose inspiration, whatever, things happen in life and you, you probably will not be able to continue doing that forever. So yeah, I've thought a lot about like on YouTube how it's really intense on this platform. We expect at least one video a week or you know, two videos a week or at least one video a month, but it's gotta be a banger, it's gotta be a masterpiece. And like, it's just so interesting to set these um, expectations and, and workloads on creativity. And that's something that I actually wanted to touch on in this, this recap is the idea of labor. Cause a lot of people were still, well, not a lot. I had a couple comments saying like, yeah, but essentially YouTube is an easy job. It's a very privileged job, which I had mentioned. It is a, a massive privilege to be a content creator full time. But they were saying like, if it's your job, then like you need to show up for your job. Like I can't just not go to my job for a couple weeks. Like YouTubers shouldn't be able to do that either. I really wanted to unpack all of those ideas about what is labor. <laughs> and um, like YouTube is my source of income. But in terms of being a job, no, it's not the sort of job where I have to show up in a specific capacity. To be honest, I think I wrote these things down actually. I have the most embarrassing notes on my phone. <laughs> I, side note, I've been playing some mobile games and I get weird when I play any sort of games, but like I was making notes of like what tasks I need to do in these things next. Like I need to like build wood to build my house upgrade. I'm playing a game called Family Island among others. So it's embarrassing. Um, I used to do that when I when I played Stardew Valley. I had this whole page of just like, you know, erratic notes of like, like so-and-so's birthday, like these are the gifts that they like and I need to get this ready and I need to collect these items. And I'm like, this game is supposed to be fun and relaxing. I think I'm taking it too seriously. I don't know where my note is, if ever. Did I write it? <laughs> what am I saying? Oh, my feet are falling asleep. That's what I get for sitting on the floor, I'm trying to film videos again. So yeah, the idea of labor. I guess I was thinking about the social contract 
of being a YouTuber or a content creator because like most YouTubers don't have an actual contract where they have to create a certain amount of videos per week or per year or whatever. Sometimes people do work for a production company or something where they have to do that, like TBT to Grace Helbig, Daily Grace. She had to make those videos. She was contractually obligated. She was being paid by the company that she was working for and not just like, she wasn't just creating as an independent YouTuber. So we do have a an unofficial social contract though, this sometimes spoken obligation to post like, oh, you know, my upload day is Thursday, I post once a week. Most YouTubers have that, but it's like, obviously it's not, <laughs> it's not a legal contract. It is a verbalized promise that is sometimes or often broken, but it's not literally a contract. It's not the same as work where you are required to show up for your employer and do specific tasks during specific hours. It's more flexible than that. You're working for yourself. Technically, you can create content and do your work whenever you want. So that's something I've been thinking about. Cause yeah, like the people who say like YouTubers should treat this like a job, like you should like wake up and like work nine to five and you should post a video every week cause that's, that's what you owe us, that's your job. And it's like, technically we don't have a job. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like technically, aside from my like outstanding like sponsorships that I have contracts for. Those are things like deadlines that I have to meet, content that I have to create. If I didn't have any of those, technically, I have no obligation to ever post online ever again, you know? But it's my, it's my choice and it's, I have some extent of free will <laughs> to take advantage of this platform that I have and this way to make income, if that makes sense. And I think it's that level of freedom that's kind of, um, a double-edged sword for creators. It's like, you do have the freedom to take time off or to rest or decide your work schedule. Are you gonna work a lot? Are you gonna work a little, you know? Are you going to put in as much time and effort to make as many videos as possible? Or are you going to do enough work to make the minimum amount of videos to survive to the, like, to suit the sort of living that you want. And that's certainly a privilege, obviously. Again, let me emphasize, it's of course a privilege to be a YouTuber, hello. Interesting that we are here on Patreon now talking about this because now I'm in another sort of social contract with all of you. If I'm saying, hi, can you join my Patreon if you like my content or if you wanna see this extra content, this is now an agreement that we have where you're giving me X amount of money and in return, I should give you the things that I have promised. That I think is a very different situation than the standard YouTube subscriber or viewer relationship. Like, yeah, somebody can subscribe, but that doesn't mean that you owe them a video every week or whatever amount of time. Um, whereas here, you're directly giving me money. <laughs> and so like, yeah, I do owe you. But yeah, I, I'm interested in seeing, you know, how this Patreon goes. I'm excited to have this other outlet to talk with you guys and talk more about the videos and whatever else we wanna talk about. We'll see if I do, you know, live streams or whatever. I'm still figuring out exactly what works. And I think as the community forms, we'll see what works for all of us, not just me. I'm excited to be able to talk with more of you directly because that's really something that I've been missing lately. I feel like I've, I've withdrawn myself a lot and I'm not posting very often on many other platforms. Um, the most I do is like a couple stories once in a while, but I'm really not being too personal. And I like haven't been recording my podcast in the last few months. I haven't been um, doing many vlogs. I've been doing my like newly reviews on my second channel, but I just generally feel like I haven't been able to have this casual dialogue that I'm used to having at some capacity. So I'm excited. I'm excited for it. There's also even a level of conflict on like monetizing and creating a paywall to have this connection. So I just, I want to be very like transparent about like, I'm not trying to buy or are you trying to buy my love? Maybe. <laughs> like, um, I don't want this to be another extension of like taking advantage of the parasocial relationship. I really do like to get to know my viewers. And that does not mean that each of us are best friends because to be honest, unless we've spoken, I don't know you yet, but we can get to know each other. Do you know what I mean? I hope we're here for this. That was pretty much it. That was what I wanted to touch on for this video recap thing. This response to the, the response. Um, is that all I wanted to say about labor? I don't know, I guess generally I'll repeat myself again <laughs> and say 
the expectation that people should be able to force themselves to just do creative work consistently and to expect that that work is still going to be inspired and genuine and enjoyable for the creator to make, it's just hard, you know? Like, again, I've, I've somewhat witnessed the process of some of my internet friends, like, writing books, for example, and I haven't even seen, like, the whole depth of, like, what that is like, but from seeing their process little by little, it's cool to see how that happens over time, like, writing a book and all the edits and, um, everything that goes into publishing and the build-up to a book release, like, all these little components, and I'm just thinking, like, Clearly, there's so much under the tip of the iceberg that goes into publishing a book. Similarly, I think that's kind of true for, for YouTube as well. And I just think that, like, again, the time expectation, the assumption that because you make money from YouTube, because you're in a position where you're making money from this platform, that means that you have an obligation to consistently post things. I tried to compare this, this type of way to earn income to other things, but it's really hard to compare. It's almost like you're earning royalties or something. I mean, it is just ad revenue, but it's just different because it's like you're not earning a flat rate, except from like sponsorships or whatever, but like the actual revenue that you earn from making videos, I think I'm getting lost. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, Anyway, I think it's, it, the problem is I think it's difficult to distinguish our work habits from the capitalist societies that we live in. And so I think that's why people are so quick to say, hey, YouTubers, like YouTube is your job, so do your job. You're supposed to work at least 40 hours a week because that's what is accepted in society. That's what's considered full-time work. And if you don't fulfill those requirements of putting in those hours, then you don't deserve the income that you're earning. But it's like, the work of being a YouTuber is not putting in 40 hours. You could put in 10 hours and make a video. You could put in 20 hours, 30 hours. You could put in 80 hours to make a video, 200 hours. Um, so that, that doesn't fit what our typical conception of what work is in a capitalist society. Am I making sense? <laughs> Gotta stop questioning myself, okay? But anyway, I think it's healthy for creators and for viewers to continue to think of YouTube as a more post as you can, post as you want sort of platform. More like, I made a thing and now I'm ready to offer it, rather than this very transactional, like, I'll see you every week at the same time, I will create a product for you, I will, you know, I will do whatever labor it takes to create thing, because like, that's not where, that's not where the most art is going to come from. That's not where the most creative ideas are going to come from. Um, sometimes they come out of that pressure. Sometimes the procrastination gets to you and you put in that crunch time, kind of like this video happened for me. A video I thought was going to flop and not do well ended up being my best video in a really long time. Interesting, you know. But again, please share your thoughts here. I'm gonna figure out, I don't know, do you guys like Discord? How does Discord work? Do you need a moderator, moderators for that? I don't know how any of this works. So if you guys are interested in doing that or wanna let me know how that works or how other creators tend to, to handle those things, let me know. I would like us to be able to talk here. But thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you being here and listening to this. So thanks so much. It's been cathartic. I'm gonna continue running my mind through that endless loop of like, what is labor? What is work? What is income? Uh, are there any obligations here or what? I don't know. <laughs> what is the social contract between creatives and consumers? Interesting. Again, bra strap falling down. Ugh. Ew, on the other side too. No, I'm just kidding. That's just the shirt. Okay, that's all. It's Friday. It's the weekend now. I'm going to chill with Nathan. We're gonna watch Falcon and Winter Soldier. That's a whole other thing. I've become, I guess, a Marvel fan. I wouldn't say a stan, but I've watched most of the Marvel movies now, and there are a lot of thoughts to be said. I know people say that, like, Marvel is a, Marvel is sometimes considered to be a lower, or at least, like, a mainstream form of entertainment and some people think like oh superhero smash movies are dumb but hey I enjoy them and sometimes that's all I want I just want entertainment that I can enjoy um we can get into the the political implications of the Marvel universe of course and all of the different adaptations of other superhero universes but on an entertainment level I'm entertained and I like it and it's something that brings me joy so that's where we are okay my voice is gone now going to chill okay thanks bye